Good afternoon. Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Dr. Amy Fox on geomechanics for today's energy industry. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of the audience. So I'm going to launch some polling questions. And the first question is, what is your primary discipline? We're starting to get some responses. Looks like quite a few of the audience members are geoscientists and a few petroleum engineers. We're still receiving some responses, but I have about 90% of you voted. So let's go ahead and close that poll and share the results. 89% geoscience, 11% petroleum engineers. And our next question is, how many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? So quite a few of you have over 30 years experience and then um, several in the other categories as well. We're still getting answers. Okay. 90% of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close that poll, share the response. We have 60% with over 30 years, and the rest of the group is distributed between 1 and 30 years. So it looks like we've got a diverse audience today. Mm -hmm. uh, before I introduce Amy, I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted, but you can ask questions using the uh, Go to Webinar question feature throughout the webinar. We'll cover the Q&A at the end of the session today, and you will be anonymous. And so I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. And introduce Amy. So uh, Amy Fox is our speaker today, for geome geomechanics for today's energy industry. And Amy is an expert in geomechanics. She earned her geology degree from University of New Hampshire, master's and PhDs in geophysics from Stanford, and uh, started her career early in Palo Alto with Geomechanics International, and uh, has worked in the industry for many years, including working at um, GMI as subsidiary of Baker Hughes. Uh, now she resides in Canada, where she consults and provides training courses for SCA. And the class that Dr. Fox teaches is Reservoir Scale Geomechanics. And that class is being offered this fall in our new live online format. Those are mornings, North America time, uh, October 14th through 16th. And you can see the details of the class there. Uh, it's offered virtually, so you can take it from anywhere in the world. Uh, we can also set up uh, Dr. Fox to deliver it virtually to your location, or she can teach it in person, of course. And so be sure and contact us if you are interested in scheduling her class. We have a series of webinars coming up in addition to the one you're listening to today. Next week, uh, September 8th, that's a Tuesday, we have Open Hold Logs with Bob Barbet. Wednesday, September 9th, we have Geo Pressure for Exploration Success with Dr. Salim Shaker. And then finally in October, October 14th, uh, we'll be learning about biostratigraphy with evolution of the Mergwai ter Terrace in offshore Myanmar. So be sure and contact SCA for all your needs, whether it's consulting, direct hire services, projects and studies, or training. And I'm going to change the presentation rights to Amy and give you control. Amy, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Susan. Uh, here we go. All right. Now, if somebody could just confirm for me that you're seeing my presentation, that would be awesome. Looks We're good. Seeing. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm going to turn on my my pointer. So thanks everyone for your interest in my presentation today. Um, it's always fun to give these presentations. You never know. It's kind of like a, a lottery. You never quite know who's going to be there and what kind of questions they're going to ask. Um, so hopefully um, you'll get something out of this next 45 minutes or so. 
Um, I'm going to start out by talking about where geomechanics fits into today's energy industry, given the title of the talk. That's the main subject. Um, and then I'm going to go over some fundamental geomechanical principles that everybody should be aware of and talk about some specific applications like drilling and completions and fractures and faults. And, and then I'll wrap up and there should be some time at the end for, uh, for you to ask some questions if you want. So I'm going to start with this poster that I found. Um, it comes from the Geological Society of London, and it's their vision of where geoscience fits into the future of, um, or at least the near to long-term future of um, humanity, really. Um, and it, you can see it covers a large number of different industries and areas, and they've labeled each with their sustainable development goals. And um, I think it's a great educational poster, and you can see down on the lower right-hand corner here, this is where hydrocarbon sits. And traditionally, this is where people might think geomechanics is, is focused. But really, I can easily um, point out several other areas on this poster where geomechanics is really important. Um, for example, an emerging um, area is geothermal. It's been around for a long time, but uh, we're seeing governments focusing a lot of attention and funding on geothermal. So I find my own interest in geothermal increasing and and my clients coming to me for geothermal applications. So there's a wide variety of energy related areas where geomechanics might be important, not just in oil and gas. So some geomechanics fundamentals, okay? At the very, very basic level, we're trying to talk, understand stresses in the earth and how the stresses in the earth affect anything we're trying to do, whether it's mining or civil engineering or oil and gas or geothermal. So First, you have to figure out what are the stresses in the Earth's crust. And we divide the Earth's crust into three different types of what we call faulting styles or stress regimes. Um, one is normal faulting, and you see that here in this little cartoon diagram. And each regime is defined based on the relative magnitude of the principal stresses. So we have three principal stresses. In a lot of the Earth's crust, one is vertical and two are horizontal. And so that's, we kind of simplified to that situation. And in a normal faulting environment, um, you see that the minimum horizontal stress is the least principal stress. And then we have SH max, or the maximum horizontal stress, which is the intermediate stress. And then we have the vertical stress. In what we call a strike slip environment, the difference is that the vertical stress is now intermediate. So we have one horizontal stress that's less than the vertical stress and one horizontal stress that's greater than the vertical stress. And finally, in a thrust faulting environment or a reverse faulting environment, the vertical stress is now the minimum principal stress and both horizontal stresses are higher than it. So we have this great resource that's been developed over decades now called the World Stress Map. And, um, you can just Google World Stress Map and go to their site and play around and investigate different parts of the globe and create your own maps. But in general, what it is, is a repository of stress data from all over the globe from a variety of different data types. Anything from borehole observations to earthquake um, information from earthquake focal mechanisms. And you can see a lot of the data points. Um, so these different colors, red, green, blue, and black, these are the data points. And um, what they are showing you is there's a bit of a long axis to each data, data point, and that's telling you the orientation of the maximum horizontal stress. And then the color tells you the relative stress magnitude. So the colors match my previous cartoons here. So red for normal, green for straight slip, and blue for reverse. And you can see different parts of the globe where these different faulting styles kind of dominate. And then where the symbols are black, um, we don't have stress magnitude information, we just have stress orientation information. So a lot of our stress data is restricted to plate boundaries where we get lots of earthquake data. You can really see that over here in Asia. Um, and then a lot of the black regions are actually where we have a lot of oil and gas activity. So we get a lot of stress orientation data from oil and gas activity, not a lot of stress magnitude data. There are some efforts um, being made now to try to interpolate between areas where we have lots of data to try to understand um, the stresses in those data 
four areas, and this is a recent publication just out this year from the USGS and Stanford University where um, they've interpreted a, a stress field for all of North America. So something we need to do is we need to move from a practical standpoint, we need to move from this in situ earth stress scenario um, and we have to understand what our relative stress magnitudes are. Maybe we can actually put numbers to these stress magnitudes and we need to translate that into um, our practical application. So in a lot of say oil and gas and geothermal, um, that means well bores. And another thing we need to pay attention to is our rock properties and our um, pore pressure. So once we have all that information, we can translate that into our particular application. And in this case, I'm showing a vertical and a horizontal well being drilled. And all along that well bore, we have what we call the local stress concentration. So the fact that we've put a hole into a block of material that has stresses acting on it means we've set up a, a concentration of stresses around that hole. And you can see a, an illustration example of that here. One way that I find people, um, I can get the light bulb to go on in people's heads, they can sort of understand this whole well board of stress concentration thing, is to use a simple uh, example. So say you have a sponge and you put a hole in the sponge and then you squish the sponge, the sponge, the hole in the sponge turns into um, an oval. And what's happening is the sponge is actually stretching here and down here, and then it's kind of squishing here and here. And so what happens in, in say, a, um, a hole we put in rock is the rock is stiff, so it doesn't turn into an oval, but we do still get these areas of tension around the well and areas of compression around the well. So one of the things um, I want to point out at this point, I'm going to go over a few different what I call misconceptions of geomechanics. And perhaps it's oversimplifying a little bit, but at this level that we're talking at right now, I think um, it's pretty appropriate. So one of the things I want to point out with my first misconception is that there isn't necessarily a simple way to figure out what our stress magnitudes are. Um, and a lot of the shortcut I see a lot of people make is trying to quantify them just based on seismic or log data and trying to calculate stresses that way. And there's some very important assumptions that go into that workflow. The first is that the horizontal stresses are equal and they're a function of the vertical stress, which means they're um, necessarily less than the vertical stress. And we've already seen two stress environments where that's not true. And also, uh, that the pore pressure is simply a function of compaction. And so this doesn't really work in tectonic basins where we have a lot of um, high stress and we probably have things contributing to pressure um, such as thermal effects and, and hydrocarbon generation. So um, we kind of can rule out two stress states entirely and maybe this workflow still works in normal faulting environments. Um, and the reason this persists is because this was the workflow in many early conventional oil and gas plays. So there's a reason why um, there's a lot of literature out there that will tell you how to calculate stress or pressure from logs or seismic, but it's important to realize where that's applicable and where it's not. So now I'm gonna move right into uh, geomechanics for drilling. So we talked about the stress concentration. Um, here's that same example again, and we have some high stress areas and low stress areas around the well bore. Um, and the stress concentration is a function of our in-situ stresses, our pore pressure, and our rock mechanical properties. But it's also a function of the fluid pressure in the well, temperature of the fluid in the well, and the hole orientation. So there are some things we can control here to affect our stress concentration. So here's a cartoon of a well bore, and um, we've got the stress concentration here illustrated by this gray. And you can see the gray gets lighter as you get away from the well. The stress concentration is very local to the well bore. It only persists for about uh, a couple of borehole radii away from the well, and then it's gone. Um, but it can be quite significant at the well bore wall. So here I've illustrated our areas of compression and our areas of tension. And what happens is if the compressive stress around the well exceeds the compressive strength, 
then the well will fail and we'll get what we call breakouts. So this is an illustration of breakouts here. And this is um, an actual laboratory breakout where you can see chunks of rock kind of shearing off and eventually those fall into the well and you get these borehole enlargements. Um, and if the tensile stress around the well bore exceeds the tensile strength, then you get cracks at the well bore wall, these what we call induced tensile cracks. And um, just a reminder that we, we need specialized core tests to determine the compressive and the tensile strength of the rock. And I'm not gonna really get into that here, but that's where you would turn for that information is to laboratory tests. So one of the misconceptions, or misconception number two for today, is this common belief that you should keep your mud weight or the, the, the density of the fluid in your well bore um, as low as possible above the formation pore pressure. You keep it above the formation pore pressure to prevent inflows of fluids, but you wanna keep it low because it's um, thought that higher mud weights will decrease rate of penetration. And then the other end is that you keep the mud weight below what we traditionally call the frac gradient or the minimum principal stress to avoid loss circulation. And this is, I see this all the time, even decades after we've known better in, in the geomechanics world. So the fact is really that you wanna keep the mud weight high enough to prevent excessive breakout. Um, and you may have different limits that you wanna put on those breakouts. If I go back to my cartoon here, we measure the severity of the breakouts by the angular width of this. So this is what, maybe a 40 degree breakout or something. Um, and you may have different limits in a horizontal well, you might wanna keep those under 60 degrees. Um, in a vertical well bore, you can be a little bit less cautious and maybe allow 90 degree breakout. So um, you wanna prevent excessive breakout and you have to define what that means. And then you wanna keep it below the point at which you get the serious tensile fractures because at that point you might start to lose circulation. So I'll go back to my cartoon. We get these tensile cracks and if they're just local to the well bore, they don't propagate out into the formation and they're not a problem. But if they get excessive, they may propagate out into the formation and connect up with some other fractures or permeable pathways and cause some serious loss circulation. So, we have what we call the mud weight window, which is that lower bound and upper bound, and it tells us what mud weights we want to use while we're drilling. And we, just a reminder that we need to consider the entire whole section. So what you're looking at here, I'll go from left to right, is um, a little lithology track here that shows we're in a sand shale sequence. Um, this is a, a plot of uh, borehole azimuth. So the azimuth is pretty consistent here around 140, 150 degrees, and the borehole inclination. So it starts out not deviated very much, but as we go deeper here, it deviates more until it's, it's about, what is that? 65 or so degrees deviated. And as you go along the well and you go through the different lithologies and the different, there'll be different rock strengths, different pressures. And so your minimum mud weight to avoid your excessive breakouts might vary quite significantly as you go along the well. And that's what you see here in this red line. Um, but really you need to consider the entire open hole section. So you can't drill with high mud weight through here and then decrease your mud weight here and not expect pro problems to happen. Sorry, I don't know if you can see that, but thank you, Microsoft. Um, so you, you would end up with enlargements here. So really you need to keep the mud weight above the highest minimum mud weight for the entire open hole section, which puts that boundary right here at this green line. And then here's our frac gradient. We don't want to exceed that. So that's our purple line. So this is our mud weight window. If you drill outside the mud weight window, um, you may end up with some really common drilling problems, um, hole cleaning problems, fill on bottom, caving, stuck pipe, tight hole issues. You might have to ream and clean the same section of the hole over and over again. Um, and all these things are indicators that you have excessive breakouts or even washouts. So if those breakouts get wide enough that the entire hole fails, then that's called a washout. And what you need to do to deal with that is to increase your mud weight um, and other, you know, ex clean the hole over and over again. So this is a 
a table of problems like these ones I'm mentioning and their geomechanical causes and what we usually see on the rig happening to try to deal with them. And just to point out that whole orientation matters. So we've moved in oil and gas to a lot of pad drilling in our unconventional resources. And so all of our laterals on a pad are gonna be going in the same direction to take advantage of um, stress controls on hydraulic fracturing, which I'll get into later. Um, but as you can see here, the build sections are all over the place. And you might be in a, in a stress environment where that matters. So in a situation like this, I might have a client come to me and say, look, we drilled all our wells in the same direction and we used the same mud weights and we did everything the same but some had problems and some didn't, and we don't understand why. And so I can generally quantify the stresses and come up with a plot such as this one to explain what happened. And so this is um, what we call a lower hemisphere stereo net, and a vertical well would plot right in the middle here. A good way to think of it is like, like you're looking down at the plot, the plot is horizontal, and you have a vertical well that's just going straight down. So that plots right in the center of the plot. And then as you increase the deviation of a well, it's gonna plot further and further out towards the circumference. So a well deviated 60 degrees to the north would plot right here. And what this is showing in the colors is the minimum mud weight um, for that. Uh, you build this for a particular depth. So say this is a, a formation somewhere in the build section for all these wells. And it tells me that the minimum mud weight is not the same depending on your well orientation. So you need lower mud weights if you're highly deviated to the northeast or southwest in this example. Then if you deviate like these wells did, if you deviate to the um, northwest or southeast, in which case you need higher mud weights. So depending on where you are in the build section, you might be in here, in which case you need fairly high mud weight no matter um, what direction you're drilling or by the time you're 60 degrees deviated, you need higher mud weights over here and here than you do to the northeast and southwest. So now I'll talk about completions a little bit. I'm going to start off kind of with a timeline of hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing goes back to um, before 1950, and uh, actually quite a lot of progress was made over the decades um, after the 1950s, when the US government got interested in um, trying to exploit hydraulic fracturing to produce oil and gas in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that's when we started really understanding hydraulic fracturing and building models and starting to experiment with horizontal wells and multiple fracture stages. And then in uh, around 2000 is when MSHF or multi-stage hydraulic fracturing really took off and what we've seen since is just an explosion of these types of wells and also sort of an explosion of commercial packages for trying to model them. Um, and right now we're seeing the emergence of test sites uh, that are drilling back through or coring back through hydraulic fractured rock and trying to understand what is actually going on with the hydraulic fracture models and it's actually sort of challenging our understanding of hydraulic fracture. Well, what the last 10 years kind of felt like in geomechanics from a practical standpoint was the operators just took off and were hydraulically fracturing like crazy and trying to keep that rooted in fundamental geomechanics was kind of a um, very difficult task. We were kind of left in the dust. But these test sites, I think, are really going to change the game for geomechanics and completions. I think um, it's going to, the fact that we can go back and look at the fractured rocks and we can see that it doesn't match our models is really going to motivate us to um, take a second look and maybe slow down a little bit and try to apply some science to understand what's going on. Um, so, some areas where geomechanics really can be important in completions is not just hydraulic fracture modeling, but also understanding reservoir quality and what, what parts of the rock we might wanna complete and stimulate. Um, what is going on with what, what we call frac hits or fracture driven interactions. So that's when you, know, you 
hydraulically fracture one well and something happens at another well or a different stage in the same well. And also understanding induced seismicity, what it's trying to tell us and how we can use it to optimize our wells. And then of course, as always, um, in the realm of research to develop new methodologies. And I just thought I'd share this. I thought this was a great list. I happened upon it in a, in a thesis, a PhD thesis, which I've referenced down here, but it's a great list that brings home the point that there's a lot of parameters that the operator can control in hydraulic fracturing and try to optimize their completion strategy. And you see this whole list of things here from number of stages, perforation intervals, fluid types and rates, and et cetera. And also I added hole orientation. But there's also just as many factors that are um, that are controlled by nature, that are that are controlled by the rock and the geology and the in situ stresses. And it's important to keep that in mind when we're planning our completions. So that brings me to my third geomechanical misconception for the day, and that's the brittleness trap. Um, so a very common thing, at least in North America, um, over the past several years has been this concept of brittleness that you use to try to quantify the quality of the rock in terms of how well it's going to fracture. Um, and a very common one that's sort of grabbed on it to people is um, that you need high Young's modulus and low Poisson's ratio. I can't go into what these are right now, but you've probably heard them, heard those terms. And the fact if you have that, then you have brittle rock, which is better. And what this really is, um, in my mind, is it's an easy button. It's um, so We can easily calculate Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio from logs and seismic. And so if this is true, then we have an easy way to evaluate the quality of the rock. But the fact is, um, that's not the one and only answer. So when we're talking about brittleness, what we really want to understand is what is the component of our rock that is made up of brittle minerals versus what is the component of our rock that's made up of ductile minerals. And this is just an example from the literature that's showing different, some examples from different plays in North America. Um, and, you know, potentially it's useful in evaluating plays and comparing different plays. And it might also be useful for determining rock quality in a specific play. Um, but there are at least 15 published definitions of brittleness, and they're based on not just um, calculations from logs, but also on lab measurements, on our lithology, our mineralogy, as shown here. And so it, it would be important in whatever area someone's operating to understand what is the best way to quantify this rock quality parameter that's being called brittleness. So the final thing I'm going to talk about today, and I'm just checking my time, looks like I'm doing pretty well, is um, fractures and faults. So I like to say that fractures and faults are complex. Um, their characteristics can be a uh, function of many different parameters, including structure, uh, stress, and rock properties. Is there layering? Is there different strength properties in the different layers? There are different fluid content and pressures. Um, what's the history of the rock? Has it gone through multiple episodes of deformation? So there might be multiple fracture sets. Um, has it gone through uplift, unloading, uh, or some thermal complexities, some, di some diagenetic or mineral, uh, mineral changes that might affect the fractures or cause fractures? So there's quite a few things that can be affecting fractures and faults in um, whatever rock we're interested in. So it's important to understand those natural fractures. We need to understand, first of all, what is the existing fracture population? So what's the, the density of the fractures? What's the orientation of the fractures? What kind of fractures do we have? What are the mechanical properties of those fractures? And then if we quantify the current day geomechanical setting, then we can look at the interaction between those fractures and the current day geomechanics. So a really important concept that, get, that is applied in many different um, industries, but especially in um, oil and gas and geothermal, is what we call critically stressed fracture theory. And it's, it's really quite simple. Um, it started out 
with some authors back in the 90s asking a very simple question um, in a variety of different, they had three different areas they were looking at and they said, well, why do some fractures flow in terms of fluid flow and how come others don't? So the data set they had was really good. Um, they had detailed log data, they had detailed temperature data, they had image logs so they could actually identify fractures on image logs and um, quantify those fractures in terms of their strike and dip. And um, they were looking at the differential thermal gradient near each of the fractures using this kind of concept here. This is um, a cartoon of um, if warm fluid was entering the wellbore through this fracture here, you'd see a little bump in the temperature. And if you looked at the gradient of the temperature, you'd see this kind of a signal here. And so this is sort of a real example of that where there's this relatively large fracture and we see a, a bump in the differential gradient. And so they were able to identify the, the fracture sets in the image logs and the fractures that were flowing. And they found, well, some fractures were flowing, but some that were fairly large and probably should have been flowing weren't flowing and it was important to understand why. So a good way to get this concept across is using um, a little cartoon like this to talk about more Coulomb theory. So if you look at this cartoon down in the lower left, we've got a fracture plane and it has some, um, some thickness to it and there's a pore pressure acting in there. And then we have um, our in situ stresses acting on the fracture. So we have our two horizontal stresses and our vertical stress. And depending on the orientation of that fracture in space, we can do a calculation and quantify the normal stress, which acts perpendicular to the fracture plane and the shear stress, which acts parallel to it. So say we had a set of fractures shown up here and we did this calculation for each one. And then we simply plotted the results on uh, a plot, an XY plot, where we have um, shear stress on the Y axis and what is called the effective normal stress on the X axis. And the effective normal stress is simply the total normal stress minus that pore pressure. So say we plot those on there, we get a variety of different points on the plot. And some of them plot above this line here, which is defined by the coefficient of sliding friction, which represents the frictional strength of the fractures. So a good way to, to kind of picture this, again, was sort of a real world example or a non-geology example. Um, when I teach in person, I tend to use props for this, but I had to pull out my illustra illustration skills in PowerPoint to do it virtually. Um, so say you have a table and you've got a couple of books stacked on that table. There's a, a normal stress acting on those books, which is due to gravity and then there's zero shear stress acting on the books. If I tilt those books, now the shear stress has gone above zero. There is some shear stress acting on them now, and there's still a bunch of normal stress. It's decreased, but it's still not too large, and there's friction keeping those books um, from sliding. If I tilt the books even further, the shear stress increases even more, the normal stress decreases even more, and eventually I'm gonna overcome that frictional stability between the two books and the top one's gonna to slide down to the table. So that's sort of what we're quantifying in, on the fractures is how much shear stress and how much normal stress. And for which fractures have we exceeded this frictional limit? So the, the fractures that plot above that line, the, the, what we call the failure line on the Moore diagram, those are what we call critically stressed. Those are the ones, those are like the books where I've tilted them so much that they're gonna slide. So if we go back to the paper, um, they had three different data sets. That's why you see three different half circles on this Moore diagram. And they plotted up all their fracture data. So they quantified their stresses at each location and they plotted up the shear and normal stress on all their fractures. And they put two different failure lines on here, one for a coefficient of sliding friction of 0.6, and one for a coefficient of sliding friction of one. When that's kind of where we know from laboratory measurements, that's sort of the range in real rocks. And they found that pretty much all the flowing fractures were plotting in this wedge here above the 0.6 failure line. So 
it was the critically stressed fractures that were flowing. Now, wh why would that be? If it might be hard to picture, um, I'm going to use a real rock to illustrate why that might be. So, I found this rock on a beach not too long ago, and it had recently fractured along an old fracture line. You can see that here. And if I hold the two pieces together, they actually like really lock into place. I can't move either side of the rock. And if I just shift the two sides a little bit, I get this self-propping kind of thing where now the rugose surfaces, they don't match up. And so the rock is holding itself open. So if we have critically stressed fractures, they've probably slipped in the recent geologic past. And there's some of the, probably some of the self-propping going on and they probably haven't had time to um, cement over again before they slip again. And that's what we think, that's why we think critically stressed fractures are permeable. So um, just to go back to our more diagram again and point out what happens when we increase pore pressure, it reduces this effective normal stress. And so what it does is it essentially moves our entire more coulomb plot to the left and it might cause some fractures that weren't critically stressed to become critically stressed now this could be really important uh, not just in oil and gas but particularly in geothermal um, there's a lot of talk these days about egs or engineered or enhanced geothermal systems this is the basic concept there's some kind of a natural fracture system or permeable system underground. And there's different ways to enhance that or um, engineer or hydraulically fracture or do something to enhance the natural permeability system in the subsurface. And um, in a lot of cases, this is going to depend on the presence of critically stressed fractures. So what happens when we do a hydraulic fracture in an oil and gas well or a geothermal well. Well, hydraulic fractures, we generally picture them as like a penny shaped opening and they open in the direction of the minimum principal stress. So I've kind of put a hydraulic fracture in each of our little cartoon fault blocks. And you see that in normal faulting and strike slip faulting, the minimum stress is horizontal. And so that hydraulic fracture is going to want to be vertical. But in a thrust or reverse faulting environment, the minimum stress is vertical. And so our hydraulic fracture is going to be horizontal. So that could be important, but there's also an importance in the pressure increase. There's the reason I showed that, that diagram before where we increased the pressure and watched what happened to the Moore diagram. Because here's our failure line for a pre-existing fracture. I've also added now a failure line for intact rock. So at some point, as you move that circle to the left, you're going to hit that point, and maybe you're actually going to start breaking intact rock in shear. But you won't cause any kind of tensile failure, which is what a hydraulic fracture is, until you're actually past this axis and into the negative part over here. So the bottom line is, as we hydraulically fracture and we increase pressure on pre-fractured rock, um, we're likely to cause slip on pre-existing fractures and perhaps cause shear on intact rock before we cause um, the rock to fail in tension. Okay, um, so to wrap up, I've talked about, I haven't gone into much details about rock mechanical properties, but we have mentioned them a little bit. They're definitely important in our, geolo in our geomechanics um, understanding. We've talked a little about bit about formation pressures as well and how changing the pressure during various operations can cause different things to happen and then um, i hope i've driven home the importance of the in situ stress state no matter what you're doing um, you need to understand what that is before you can understand how it's going to affect what you're working on and so these are the components that we call the geomechanical model So for oil and gas, I've been saying for about 10 years now that um, there's been kind of a balancing act between reducing risk and cost during drilling and optimizing our completions. Um, it turns out that in a lot of different environments, the things you wanna do to optimize your completions might actually make your drilling a little bit riskier 
And so there's sort of a trade-off there. I think today's energy landscape for geomechanics is starting to look quite different. Um, we're starting to see a, a big uptick in, in geothermal, as I mentioned, also in um, storage and sequestration. So whether that's carbon or energy storage, and also um, we're seeing some increased attention on induced seismicity. Um, our tolerance for that is a little bit dependent on po politics and um, population density. For example, in oil and gas, there's a region in British Columbia here in Canada where the minimum allowable induced event has a magnitude of four, whereas in the UK, it's more like around two. And um, that really has to do with different, different jurisdictions and different risk associated with, er with earthquake hazard. And then there's other areas that we're going to see geomechanics become important in energy as well. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of hand wringing about the demise of oil and gas and the increase of new energy sources. And um, I think the future is still bright for geomechanics as we enter into these new spaces. And so if you want to learn more, if any of that was interesting to you, as Susan mentioned, I'm teaching online October 14th to 16th. And then um, still on the books is an in-person course in Midland, although I'm, I don't know what the status of that one in particular, but it's still on the website. So I thought I'd mention it. And um, with that, I'd like to thank SCA for the opportunity to do this webinar and reach out. I just love educating people about geomechanics. So if you're still here, thank you for sitting through the whole presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Terrific. Thanks, Amy. I want to remind our audience that you're muted during the presentation, so you'll need to type your questions in the GoToWebinar question feature. And we're getting some questions now. You will, of Great. course, be anonymous. Um, and I want to remind everyone that later today you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to register for Reservoir Scale Geomechanics, which offered live by um, Dr. Fox, October 14th through 16th in the mornings in North America time, in person in Midland in November. Uh, our first question today comes from France. So. Um, they're still tuned in, in in the European continent, and uh, we're asking about temperature. So the question is, why is the difference of temperature between the mud and the rock and the influence on rock stress so neglected in oil and gas? And how <laughs> yeah. often do we start treating seepage losses while resuming drilling after a trip? The losses that heal themselves as the fractures are created by the delta T close themselves as temperature slowly tends to equalize. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go way back to my cartoon. It is often neglected in oil and gas. I am a guilty party there myself, and I find that um, I, I have had some geothermal work lately, and you can't ignore it there. Um, I have to go way way back here. Here we go. Um, so what happens is um, if the rock is hot and the fluid in the well bore is cooler, there is an effect. Um, it almost acts like an increase in mud weight, um, even though that's not what it is, it's temperature difference, but the effect is sort of the same as an increase in mud weight in that it reduces the risk of the compressional failure and increases the risk of the tensile failure. So what might happen is um, if your cooling effects cause your tensile failure to increase, you might get that sort of lost circulation. And then like they mentioned, as the temperature equilibrates between the rock and the fluid, that changes the stress concentration and perhaps those cracks will sort of close up. Um, so it's definitely a mechanism that happens. It's um, pretty frequently overlooked, except perhaps in some really, really hot environments where it's taken into account. Um, why it's overlooked or, or not overlooked, just not really included in the modeling very much. I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, perhaps because some of the earlier uh, software packages couldn't handle a temperature effect. Um, I don't know because I, there's a lot of them I know, I've never used. Um, it is something that you'd have to, to include in your calculations. And um, it, it can be hard to quantify that 
temperature difference because you maybe have surface mud temperature and some idea of the downhole temperature, but how, how do you calculate how much the fluid has warmed up by the time it gets down to that bottom hole? Um, so that, that could be one reason. Thank you. Uh, next question on the Moore circle, how do you calculate the mu? Um, so that comes from, I'm not going to bother flipping through the slides, but um, yeah, that mu from 0 0.6 to 1, it, that comes from laboratory measurements. Um, lots of published laboratory measurements seems to put everything in that, that little window, but it can be different. It's really dependent on the rock itself, um, you know, like what the minerals are in the rock. If it's a clay-rich rock, it could be quite different from a non-clay-rich rock. So that's where we rely on researchers to do the lab work and publish the results so that we can know how to quantify that when we're doing our analysis. Thank you. Next question, can you please explain the relationship between geomechanics and sand control? Yes, I didn't get into that at all. It's a, it's a very different topic. Um, so sanding happens, or, or uh, we typically just call it sanding, when the rock itself is not well consolidated and the stresses that are forming around the well bore, um, basically it, it breaks the bonding between the grains in that poorly consolidated rock. And then there's other physics that become involved, including um, capillary pressures and um, the hydraulics to actually flow that loosened up material into the well. Um, so it's not quite as simple. This is a, the stuff I've talked about today is purely elastic failure of intact rock. And so uh, sanding is a bit of a different problem altogether. Next question. People claim you can estimate horizontal stress from AVO and impedance inversion. You did comment a bit. Is there anything else you would say? No, uh, I've, I have avoided geophysical geomechanics um, for most of my career because I've never really been working in an area where it's appropriate. So um, there are places where you can do that. And I, because I've never done it, I'm not really intimately familiar with the details. I just know that it's been a huge educational um, problem for me with my clients who are, operate in areas where it's not applicable but want to apply it anyway because they've seen it done elsewhere. So um, I don't have any specific comments on that, just, just that you ought to be very aware of whether or not that workflow is applicable to the specific geologic environment you're in. Good advice. Would you give a list of some critical factors for rock in a successful geothermal project? Uh, there seem to be only a few places where geothermal works commercially. I think we're just learning that. Um, hmm. Yeah, it, there's so much involved in the geothermal side um, outside of just the geology. It can be a bit mind blowing, uh, including, you know, for geothermal to work, um, you have to have energy storage and perhaps have to have the infrastructure to use the geothermal energy. So there's so much involved. Um, but from a geomechanical standpoint, uh, I think fractures and faults are very, very important. Um, and how you're going to connect up the, or how you're going to harness the energy from the rock. Um, so traditional geothermal, you know, you actually need the hot fluids to get to the well bore. And that's why the critically stressed fracture theory has been very important in some of those more traditional geothermal projects, um, because you, you can actually, if you can quantify what fracture sets are the ones that are flowing the hot fluids, you can drill or stimulate your wells to a very, in, to target those fractures in a very focused way. So that could be very important information. Um, so they also, lead to an indicator for commerciality. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And, and I think we're going to see, um, I know I've, I've had borehole stability work for geothermal. So some of the very mm -hmm. same principles that apply in oil and gas in that respect apply directly to geothermal. And in that case, um, I can't handle 
I can't, sorry, uh, ignore the temperature effects because we're definitely drilling into hot rock. So I've had to consider the thermal effects in that kind of situation. So which software tools are commonly used for geomechanical modeling? Oh, there's quite a few now. Uh, I know when I started my career in the late 90s, there were very few options. Um, the company I was working for, GMI, they developed their own. Um, there were some other options in, um, I believe it's some of the operators had some pretty, pretty substantial research groups in geomechanics. And I think they had some internal tools and probably the, the major, at least Schlumberger probably had something at that point. But since then, there's been a lot of uh, new tools come out. I'm, I'm not familiar with all of them by any means. Um, I happen to use one that is uh, by a company out of Houston um, because I know the guy. <laughs> you know, I know the guy that runs the company, and he lets me use the software. And um, so it depends where, what other tools you're using. What I'm seeing lately is geomechanical capabilities being built into a lot of petrophysical tools. So um, a popular one around here is called Geolog. It was, it's a petrophysics tool, but now it has a geomechanics capability for doing some of the wellbore modeling. Um, and so it, it might depend what you end up using might depend on who you know, or what other tools you're using that it's being built into. Uh, there's a lot of options now. Sounds like that's a great topic for the class. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next question, mud weights are greater at deviated wells, as you stated, maybe due to the stresses. Is it possible for you to have horizontal wells where the stressors are more and you have to drill with higher mud weights? Also, I've seen areas where both deviated wells and horizontal wells are drilled with the same mud weights. Is there any consequences to that from your perspective? Um, yeah, it really, it's very specific to uh, what the stresses are exactly at that point in the well when it has that orientation and exactly um, what the rock is, how strong the rock is. So in my, I don't remember where my stereo net went. There it is. Um, in this particular example, like I mentioned, if you're deviated, um, say you were drilling in this direction. So when you're vertical and up until about 60 degrees deviation, you need a relatively higher mud weight. Then once you get horizontal, you can actually use a lower mud weight. It's not true if you drill in this direction, you have to maintain those high mud weights. And this is just one example. Um, it's just the only way to know is to quantify the stresses where you are and do the geomechanical modeling to tell you what mud weight are you gonna need depending on what your hole orientation is. Okay, the next question is how to calculate sand failure uh, with regard to sanding. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't possibly answer that in a short answer, but there, there are specialized, uh, again, it's, there's software out there that has that capability in it. Um, you can go back to sort of the textbook cases and develop your own calculations and such. Like the physics, we understand just a matter of applying the different components in the right order. So you have to you have to try to understand when is the bond going to break between the grains? How are the grains then going to get dislodged and carried into the well bore? Um, in geomechanics consulting, at least um, the relatively small amount of sanding work I did in the past, uh, one of the primary things we could provide was um, sanding risk increases with depletion of the reservoir. So one of the things we could provide as a consulting company was at what level of depletion is that sanding going to happen and be a problem. And so then the operator has the choice to not deplete the reservoir that much, um, or at least know when the sanding is going to start so that they can um, plan on how to manage that. Okay. Um, I think you mentioned that skills in geomechanicals Geomechanics are transferable during the energy transition, and I think you specifically mentioned um, with with respect to geothermal and carbon capture and storage, are there other areas of the energy transition where skills in geomechanics would be applicable? 
Um, I think there will be. Uh, it's hard to predict the future or, or even, I mean, we think mm -hmm. we have an idea of where the energy industry is headed, but um, again, we can't predict the future. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think in general, yes, uh, there will be other areas where, for instance, um, a company had contacted me not long ago and they want to um, inject and store fluids under high pressure to produce them later to produce energy. And that's something like geomechanics is definitely important. Is it routine for us to look at that kind of situation? No, not at this point, but we'll have to right. hone our tools and um, apply our skills and apply the physics to whatever problem we're presented with. Excellent. So uh, you talked a little bit about the hydraulic fracturing test sites. What are some of the theories that they are testing out at those sites? Oh, I don't, I don't know the details. I've just seen a few. I've seen a few um, presentations. There's been quite a few over the summer, actually, through the American Rock Mechanics Association. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen some early publications. I think, you know. The results are just starting to come out and get published. I think there's a lot of researchers involved and they're still trying to sort of wrap their heads around what they're seeing in the rock versus what we thought our models were telling us previously. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of learning in the next probably say five years or so. Absolutely. Always a popular session at URTEC. Yes. The sessions on the test sites. Yeah. Standing room only crowds. Yep. So I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Later today, you'll receive a link to the recording of today's webinar and evaluation form and a link to register for Re Reservoir Scale Geome Geomechanics. It's offered live online October 14th through 16th in the mornings in North America and in person in Midland November 10th through 11th. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye. Thanks, Thanks Susan. Thanks, everyone. Bye.